since he reformed, I'm Pastor Brandon. Joined with Pastor Zach, we are pastors at Westside Reformed Church, a URC congregation in Cincinnati, Ohio. And today we wanted to kind of react and respond a little bit to something that's been happening uh, in the Church of England, and it's been you know on, on the headlines, making its way to many of our papers, and causing a lot of Christians to wonder about what to do here. But so you know, one of the headlines in the Washington Post said. Is God they them? Church of England considers gender neutral pronouns. And so the Church of England is gathering and wondering should we use a pronoun that is masculine when we refer to God? A professor from the Yale Divinity School said there is also the Christian understanding that God is transcendent of human ideas. And so this understands God as beyond human. Com- um, complete understanding of who God is and what God is. Using masculine pronouns has just been a part of human constructions of God, which have been dominated by masculine power. So there's been a masculine power he's claiming throughout the years, and that masculine power play has led into how we speak and write about about God. The New York Post uh, reported some priests have already made such changes, uh, uh, trading references to he and him simply for God or they or them, and rewriting the Our Father prayer and, and, and starting it by saying Our Father and Mother. One reverend told the UK Times, God is not male, Certainly not the white cis male with a beard sitting on a cloud that we've seen reduced and limit God so often. So they're wrestling here about, should we use masculine pronouns? Is God a he? Should we understand him in terms of of, of masculine male um, language here? I mean, so how do we how do we understand this? And you want to talk maybe, Zach, about how does the Bible speak about God. I mean, that's kind of a good place to start, right? Exactly. And we can maybe come back to some of the things that, you know, oftentimes with these kinds of things, there's like this like little tiny bit of truth going on there, but then it's like taken to some extreme Mm -hmm. that is completely unwarranted. And, but let's first make sure it's clear, like you said, that the Bible does present God as in in using uh, male language. And that, that that is indeed how the Bible does speak. And so let's first begin with uh, the Old Testament, a couple uh, verses from there to kind of demonstrate this. First from Numbers chapter 14. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. So there, Yahweh or Jehovah uh, is then, the, the Bible utilizes that, that, that masculine singular uh, pronoun, he. Uh, from Isaiah 47, our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is his name. He is the Holy One of Israel. And again from Isaiah, this is chapter 54, a little bit of a different approach to how the Bible then um, uses male language to speak about God says, for your husband, this is being my Israel, your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of armies. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. So thus far, some uh, Old Testament texts that demonstrate what ha- is the case throughout the Old Testament, really. These are not the only places where you see this, this use of pronouns or that language of husband. You find that in Hosea as well. But um, we see that clearly in the Old Testament scriptures, but also the New Testament. So, for example, within the uh, Sermon on the Mount and the, the Lord's Prayer, very famous, our Father in Heaven. So, again, Father is being used. It does not say Father and Mother if you read the Greek text, but only Father. And in John chapter 20, as Jesus is ready to ascend, he said, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. And so, again, very um, significant text and very common ways of speaking about uh, God is that language of father. And that is, of course, a a masculine term. 
And um, we could also say uh, that speaking of Jesus, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Of course, Jesus was a, a, a man. He was a, a male and when he was incarnate upon the earth. And he's also called son. And that is a, a, a clearly a, um, a masculine term as well. And so I think it's important for us to just, you know, recognize that what the Church of England um, is considering doing, and maybe it's, I don't know when the decision date is, if it's already passed even, but regardless, I, I know there are churches even here in the West Side, they're not part of the Church of England, they're already doing this. And I've seen some of their orders of service, and they remove from all language toward God, they remove all that masculine language to become uh, much more um, uh, kosher with the culture. And so we really, we see that there is a, uh, there's, there's a, an element of uh, dissonance between the language that's used in these churches and that's found in the uh, Hebrew and Greek text of the Bible. So Brandon, could you maybe talk about maybe why this, there's some problems here? Sure. So, I mean, you mentioned before how they, they, they might say something that's true or partially true, but then take it in a, a weird direction. Like, so as we're thinking about the Father, as we're thinking about the Son, even, even before He was incarnate, as we think about the Holy Spirit, the Bible uses masculine pronouns and names and categories to speak about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so, but, but we also know that God does not have a body, right? So the God does not have a physical human body with uh, the, the genes and the makeup and the chromosomes and, and those kinds of things in terms of how we think about maybe male-female categories today. Um, but that doesn't mean that God is somehow um, not male, just because he doesn't maybe fit a biological category. Um, the, the, the Bible really wants us to, to see God in, in this way. Um, the Bible tells us how to speak of God. So, I mean, th think about that for a moment. God wrote the Bible. God is telling us in the Bible how we should speak of God, right? So, for example, in Genesis 1, 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So male and female made in the image of God with masculine pronoun. Uh, God tells us also in the Bible how to speak to God. Um, so for example, in Matthew 6, you, you mentioned your father knows what you need before you even ask. Pray like this, our Father in heaven. So we are told not only how to think about God, but how to speak to God. Jesus, say this, say our Father. That's how you speak to God. By, by calling him that. The Bible tells us how to worship God. So Psalm 107.1, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Uh, the masculine um, descriptions and pronouns, I mean, it also gets to an eternal truth that the fatherhood of God is an eternal reality. The sonship of Jesus is an eternal reality. And so, you know, these are not things to be trifled with. They are not social constructs that we somehow placed upon God. No, God is giving us this. This is, we are receiving uh, language and titles and pronouns about how God wants to be addressed and how he wants to be, to be worshipped. And so, uh, you know, I think those are just a few problems with wanting to maybe rearrange um, our, you know, we're kind of reading our, current climate here in terms of gender fluidity mm -hmm. and we're wanting to then maybe place some of that on, on God. Isn't it interesting that I think the very people who are most adamant that we use their preferred pronouns don't want God to, to guide us in his pronouns? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that just I mean, so That's ironic? A, yeah. He, he gives it to us. He and then, but then they don't, they want to say, oh no, he doesn't really mean that. It's they or them. Mm. It doesn't make it, really what this comes back to is a problem with the inspiration of scripture. It does. does it not? Yeah. And that's where these kinds of heresies, it is a heresy, yeah. comes from. Is that there is a failure to recognize that the Bible is not merely something written by man. But it really is inspired and breathed out by God. 
and that therefore the text is authoritative and that that authoritative text tells us, like you said, what God is like. He condescends to us to use human language and he uses and has chosen to use the human language of father, of son, and of he. And that is important for us. But that's not to, to suggest even for the slightest moment that the, the, the female, the, the feminine is unimportant because the whole drama of God is not a gay marriage, but rather that God in Christ takes a bride to himself and that bride is the church. And that in the face of difference, we find reconciliation and the most intimate of union that can possibly be imagined. And so God is very pro-woman, uh, if you want to call it that, because the church, his bride, is that great woman for whom he's laid down his life in Christ. And so when we lose those kinds of things, we've lost the biblical plot line, and because we've ultimately lost the Bible itself, I think. Yeah. So we hope this has been uh, helpful for you. Some big things going on in the church, as always. Uh, but may we, again, commit ourselves to the teaching of Holy Scripture rather than the latest uh, fads and fashions that want to be um, thrust upon us by uh, our culture. So until next time, I'm Zach. He's Brandon. We thank you for joining us, and we hope to meet you in person someday. Perhaps join us at worship at Westside Reform Church, westsidereform.org. Thanks, and God bless. Bye-bye.